I want to, uh, just as a point of order, begin tonight by saying that the Nebraska Open Meeting Records Act is posted on a bulletin board outside the door for anyone who would wish to review it. So, it was, it was, I was struck by the fact that we are all gathered inside a building named after Abraham Lincoln and we're huddled inside an auditorium named after Ted Sorensen. Those are pretty, pretty nice bookends. You lucky links. <laughs> what we want to do tonight is I think what the founding fathers envisioned from day one what John Jay, James Monroe, James <clears throat> Madison, Thomas Jefferson envisioned when they were laying the blueprint for this new form of government we the people and look at you we are so thankful and so happy that you've all come out to discuss and have a conversation about what we feel is a very important event. Um, we think that it's a good idea to try and get people outside of the chat rooms and the ideological silos where the echo chamber can sometimes be deafening and have this conversation uh, on a very important topic in the sunlight, in the sunlight, which is almost always the best disinfectant. So we thank you so much for, for coming out and for being a part of this. We understand that this is an emotional topic. It's an intense topic. We want you to drive the conversation. You're the people. You're the people. We want to hear from you. So we're going to start by introducing the panel, and then they are each going to give a two or three minute statement that summarizes their perspective on this very complex topic. Um, my name is Joe Starita. I teach at the University of Nebraska. I'm a Lincoln native, born and raised here. Uh, I teach at the university and I write books every now and then. And I am deeply honored and very happy to kind of be the air traffic controller for tonight's conversation. But this is, this is your event. This is for you. And we want to be able to make sure that for all the students in the audience tonight that we have a very civil discourse, a very mature discourse. I have a great deal of faith in this community, and we want to hear from the panel, and then we want you to drive the event. We know you've got a lot to say, and we want to hear from you, and then you will hear from the panel. Does that all make sense? Okay, all right, so very simple. We're gonna have an oral contract. Are there any lawyers in the room? Got any lawyers here? Yes, we have one back there who will admit it. Okay, good. You're going to enforce the oral contract. The oral contract is very simple. We are going to have each of these people um, on the panel give that statement we were talking about earlier, and then we are going to open it up to the most brilliant, insightful comments that Ted Sorensen Auditorium has ever heard. Do we have a deal? All right. Good. We got a deal. Excellent. Thank you very much. So happy to see you here. Starting with this gentleman to your right. Corey Raymond. Corey Raymond graduated from UNL Law in 1999 and has been a Lincoln defense trial lawyer ever since. Mr. Raymond has two sons in Lincoln Public Schools and also volunteers as an assistant Lincoln midget football coach. He is also president of the Parents United for Greater School Security. Thank you for coming, Corey. We appreciate it. To Corey's right is Larian Gaylor Baird. She was elected to the Lincoln City Council as a citywide representative in 2013 and re-elected in 2017. Before joining the council, she was a Lincoln Lancaster County Planning Commissioner and also worked as the director of a Boys and Girls Club. She has three children, two of whom are in LPS. Thank you so much for coming. Pastor John Harris flew out of Fort Lauderdale this morning to make it to this event. He is pastor of Lincoln's First Baptist Church and president of Encouragement Unlimited, Inc. No more, not here, anti-violence project. Pastor Harris served as director of church relations at the People's City Mission and coordinator of men's ministry for City Impact, Inc. Thank you so much, John, for making that trip. Dr. Steve Joel joined Lincoln Public Schools in 2010 as superintendent. Previously, he served 10 years as superintendent in Grand Island and another eight in Beatrice. 
a native of Long Island, New York. He has degrees from Doan College, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and Kansas State University. Thank you for being here, Dr. Joel. <laughs> to Dr. Joel's right is Connie Duncan. Connie Duncan was a special education teacher for Lincoln Public Schools for 17 years. A member of the Lincoln Public Schools Board of Education. She's also a board member for Humanities Nebraska, Lincoln Community Foundation, Lutheran Family Services, and United Way. Thank you, Connie, for being here. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Katie McLee Stevenson serves as the executive director of the Child Guidance Center, the largest provider of children's mental health services in Lincoln. She also is a former member of the LPS Board of Education and has worked extensively with children and families in need in the nonprofit sector. Thank you, Katie, for coming tonight. This is really an event in many ways for students, and we are thrilled to have Maya Ramsey here representing students on this panel. She is a Lincoln High senior, and we love the fact that you're here, Maya. Thank you. <laughs> so you got some homies here, huh? <laughs> Last but certainly not least, is Jeff Blymeister. He was named Lincoln Police Chief in April 2016. He began his public service with the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office in, oh, I thought it said 1906. <laughs> You're aging very well. What's your secret? <laughs> uh, Lancaster County Sheriff's Office in 1996. He served uh, the Sheriff's Office in multiple roles and was Chief Deputy from 2012 until hired by LPD two years ago. Thank you so much, Chief, for joining us here. Okay. Thank you very much, and I think we will let uh, the panel express themselves and some of their viewpoints and thoughts on this topic, starting with Mr. Corey Raymond. Corey? Five years ago, uh, 26 six and seven-year-olds were shot uh, in Newtown, Connecticut. Six weeks ago, 17 students in Parkland were shot and killed. In between there, we've argued, we've wrung our hands, some school security has increased, which I greatly appreciate, but basically all we've done is argue about gun laws, if you really think about it. And they've been great arguments. We haven't done anything, but there's been some great arguments on Facebook that I've seen so far. That doesn't make my son safe. That doesn't make my six-year-old safe. That doesn't make my 13-year-old safe. If you're honest, it may, maybe gun laws are right. Maybe we should ban everything. I don't take a position on it, nor does my group, Parents United. We're a group of parents who have every different view you can. You can. I've got Republicans, Libertarians, Independents, Democrats. I don't have any communists, but I have everything else. And somehow we decided that we would set aside our views on guns because we don't have any faith that there's going to be anything passed now again if you think the answer to this is banning guns I encourage you to go for that if you think that arming teachers is the answer I encourage you to go find your favorite candidate and elect them so they can, they can go after that law for you but here's the thing let's be honest with ourselves is this Congress going to pass any substantive gun laws you can hate that fact but if you're honest with yourself, you know they're not. If the Democrats win Congress next year, is this president really going to sign any laws of substantive gun laws? If you're honest with yourself, no, he's not. If anything, it's going to go towards the right, if you're honest with yourselves. If you look at our state legislature and this governor, are they going to ban any guns in this state in the near future? No. You can hate that fact, and if you want to go elect somebody else, go do it. But I don't have time to wait around for you to do that. My son goes to school now, and maybe that shooting's going to happen, going to happen tomorrow. I, he I heard on the scanner today that a, a kid took off from one of the, the junior highs here in town, and they thought he had a gun. Was today the day? I can rely. Maybe I can. I can think to myself, the odds are so, so small, it's not going to happen. And I go back to that's exactly the thing that the parents at Parkland, Newtown, Virginia Tech thought. You gotta change that mentality. I'm not here to talk about fringe ideas. My group, 
my group takes no position on guns. One thing I want to also set clear, apparently I made, I made an a internet rumor today about I was the one that set this thing up and I got all sorts of friends sending me messages of what they'd seen on Facebook that I was behind this and, and I pulled the strings to have all of these people come here. I got, you know, you know, do you remember when a guy's got a hold of you and said, I need you to show up here? We thank you for that, Corey. <laughs> Thanks. I, like four months. <laughs> I had nothing to do with this. I was sitting in my office one day and the professor walked in and asked me to be on this. And I didn't want to do it at first because I said, I have no issue with gun or I don't have no opinion on guns that, with my group. And the professor actually talked me into it. Uh, so I just would like to lay that to rest that I didn't set the agenda here. Um, but I do appreciate you having me. Uh, we're happy you're here, and there is no agenda. The agenda is we want to hear from you. That's the agenda. As soon as we get everybody through with their couple of statements, we're going to turn it over to you. Larian, please. Thank you, Joe, for this invitation to be here. My pleasure. Is this on? Can you hear me? Is the mic uh, working? Ben, are you in the house? Well, I want to say thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you to the UNL College of Journalism and the others who have helped support this event. And, and thank you especially to so many concerned community members for being a part of this tonight. Um, I first want to acknowledge that when my husband and I decided to live and raise our children in Lincoln, Nebraska, the excellent schools and the safety of this community were two of the biggest reasons that made us make that decision. Uh, we're lucky that in Lincoln, we're a community where violent crime is on the decline. Since the peak year of violent crime in 1995, uh, we've seen a decline of 40% in, in those kinds of crimes in our community. And so uh, it's important to keep that perspective as we, as we talk about this. But the rise in mass shootings in our country is disturbing. It has us all on high alert and thinking about how we can take preventative measures so that something unimaginable here in Lincoln, Nebraska never happens. And I think that as we think about what are effective solutions, there's, there's no one perfect one. And there's no one and done in this effort. And it's going to require sustained, steady, stalwart efforts to prevent the kind of violence we've seen elsewhere. It's going to take a lot of smart, capable people many of whom I see here tonight who, who care. It includes reasonable, common, safe, common sense gun safety measures and policies, and includes coordinated social services, includes the generosity of our philanthropic community, and it also involves the steps each one of us can take um, as individuals, as neighbors, as parents, to get familiar with the risk factors and the protective factors that uh, affect the propensity for, for violence. Thank you, Larian. Pastor John, talk to us. Thank you, Joe. It's good to, to be here with you. No mic. <laughs> we have one mic that works. Hmm. It's good. To, thank you, Joe. Um, it's good to be here. Thank you to the panel. Say it again. Hey. <laughs> okay. Always trying to shut the brother down. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm glad we can laugh about that. Uh, Joe, the panelists, um, all of you, uh, parents, siblings, and uh, I'm here tonight. Uh, not only as the pastor of First Baptist and the president of Encouragement Unlimited, but as a, as a citizen. Uh, I had four kids attend this school. Uh, my, my wife, uh, Charlene Maxie Harris, attended this school. Her brothers attended this school. And, and tonight, uh, I'm glad that Joe said, Pastor, I want you to, do, to provide a faith, a faith perspective, not the faith perspective, because I'm sure I got church members here tonight and boy, I tell you what, if we got in a room like this, God only knows what kind of conversations we'd be having and, and what, what agreement we could possibly come to. Uh, I'm, what I'm challenged tonight about, um, as I was flying back from Fort Lauderdale, I was thinking about, man, what are you going to say? Uh, well, a, a year or so ago, past, uh, Chief Blymeister and his staff and the folks at LPD and I and a number of other citizens got together in community conversations. We had five of them. 
And, and somebody asked me, said, uh, John, you know, we haven't had anything like these other places. Why are you all having these conversations? I said, that's why we're having the conversations. Because we always seem to be more reactive than proactive. Do I have one witness out there? Yeah. I'm not going to take up an offering just yet. Just go ahead. <laughs> What, I'm, what I would, would like to know from you uh, is how uh, people of faith, yours, uh, yours truly, or my church and any other church, can add value uh, to what's happening uh, in our schools. Uh, I am a bit challenged because it always seems that we're there to pick up the pieces after something happens. You know, I'm the one who gets the call for the funeral and the, and the call to bring comfort and words of wisdom in the aftermath of what has transpired. Uh, but I'm here to say that we have those words of wisdom daily. Amen. We have those words of wisdom uh, because, and I'll just shut it down with this. We must do everything we can. And Dr. King, on the heels of his uh, death yesterday, he said, we can, if we cannot change the heart, we must do everything we can to restrain the heartless. Thank you, John. Dr. Joel, your thoughts, please. Yes, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's uh, wonderful to see everybody here. Since there's so many students in the house, I'm, I'm going to save myself some emails by announcing I don't think the storm is going to be significant enough <laughs> to call school tomorrow. <laughs> that isn't going to stop the, uh, the tweets and emails. <laughs> I, I want to say thank you to Professor Sterita and, and to panelists and, and to the community, the great community of Lincoln, because you care so much about our kids and our students. And that is, you can't put a price on that. We know that this is a hot button topic. Mm -hmm. It's a concern with everybody in this room. It's a concern with the parents and the guardians of 42,000 students. And what I'd like you to know is that we don't take that lightly. We spend a significant amount of time, we have for more than a decade, on safety and security. We've, we've invested in security personnel. In fact, we have two of less than a handful of nationally trained and certified threat assessment managers in the country. Two, two gentlemen that we were able to pry loose from Lincoln Police Department to work for us. We have secured entrance monitors. We have secure doors in many of our schools. We are working daily on training our staff to understand how important this topic is. And at the same time, trying to make sure that we have a positive and nurturing environment where kids want to come and they want to learn and they want to be successful. We brought in video cameras. We have hall walkers. We try to patrol when we can the perimeters of our buildings. I say that to you not to, not, not, not to, to offer an excuse or to, to gain an understanding. I say that to you because we spend a lot of time with what we think is our highest district priority, and that's the safety and security of the children that you entrust to us every single day. And when a tragedy occurs, like it did in Parkland and in Columbine and in Sandy Hook and many of the other places, I can, I can assure you that that ripple is immediately heard and immediately detailed inside of our district because we know we're not immune from mental health issues and some of the, some of the, some of the circumstances that crop up in a city or a school or an environment where, where students, young people, are struggling so much. But when I think about what the national media has been writing about these tragedies and, and the importance of mental health intervention and assessment as quickly as possible, I'm reminded almost on a daily basis that that's what threat assessment and threat management is. It's the ability through appropriate training to put eyes, several pairs of eyes, many eyes, on those people or those students who we've identified as struggling. Now, having said that, we have room for improvement. And this conversation is, is something that I'm looking forward to. I know many of our board members are here tonight. They're looking forward to it as well. So I just want to say thank you all for coming out tonight and being here.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Joel. Mine work? Oh, it does. Good. No teacher voice for me tonight, then. Um, as a board perspective, um, my role really is to make policy for all 42,000 students we have and 7,500 staff that we have. That is my role. But we do this through lots of listening and lots of planning. And we are listening. We want you to know we are all listening and we are planning. President Boswell couldn't be with us tonight because he had another engagement actually out of the state. But he has told our board that he wants each of our committees to look into several questions on safety. And that is all we have been working on for the last few weeks. And that is what we'll continue to work on until we feel like our students are safe. Um, other things that I am interested in, however, are after school programs. Um, the Boys and Girls Club here in Lincoln, Nebraska is a club that my husband and I were co-founders of. We brought that here because we felt that kids needed a safe place to go after school. I walk in there weekly and I see 300 students that have positive mentors, they have a place to go to feel safe, they have a dinner at night, and they have someone to confide in to talk to them about their personal feelings and what's going on in their family. I'm a firm believer that we need more after school programs so that our children have somewhere to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Katie? Good evening. As has been stated, school safety is a complex issue and I'd like to provide a perspective related to mental health. Mental health in terms of school safety is complex and I want to share a couple of observations. Let me be clear that all people who inflict violence in school settings are not necessarily mentally ill. I also want to be clear that nearly all people who do have a mental illness are not violent. Sometimes it's confusing and easy to conflate these two issues and say, well, it must be this. And I don't think that the answers are quite that simple. I think there's uh, many things that go into this, but let me touch on four. One uh, that is a necessary ingredient to help with school safety is a sense of belonging. That can be in the community, that can be at a, a community learning center, that can be at the school. And our schools need to be welcoming climates, they need to affirm all children, and they need to be a place where people know that if they're not there, somebody's going to miss them. So that's really important. The next thing that's, that's critically important is building coping strategies. We all have disappointments in life. Uh, nearly every day, I'm sure you all have had one today. But it's how we come back from that and it's how we deal with our stress and learn to deal with our stress that really makes a difference. The third is resiliency. It's related to coping strategies, but how do we bounce back? How do we help kids? know that things are going to be better, that there's going to be a better tomorrow, that even if things are rough at home or rough at school, that there are caring adults that are there to help them as well as their peers, that are not there to bully them or to alienate them, but to embrace them. And last, um, of course, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say that access to mental health services is also critical to this mix. One in five students will have a serious mental health issue one in five. Some people say that the number is higher than that. So we need to have services that are available to them. School-based services are logical. Everyone goes to school. There is not the um, stigmatizing of walking into a mental health center. Parents don't need to get kids to another appointment. School-based services make a lot of sense. And so we need to give kids access to mental health services. And I think an important part of that is having that happen in the school, provided by trained, highly supervised um, community partners. And we have some good models for that in Lincoln. There is not health without mental health. And so it needs to be part of the conversation. But please think about how it fits and what its place is. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you. Mm. Maya, what's it like to be a high school student these days? Um, uh, just thinking about it, like, so I was asked to be part of this panel two days ago. And so in those two days, 
I talked to a lot of my peers about what they wanted, like, policy-wise and what they wanted to see change in America after, like, seeing all these school shootings happen. And a lot of answers I got were just like, oh, you know, I want gun reform. And I was like, okay, so, like, what does that look like? And a lot of people, when they said, what does that look like, they were confused and they were like, uh, I don't really know. Hmm. And so I took it upon myself to do a little bit more, like, digging and see what gun reform could look like. And so I read some statistics, and I think it said that on average 31,500 people are killed by a gun um, each year, like on average, I think. And so that was like due to homicide, suicide, um, accidents, um, police encounters, all these different factors that come into like gun deaths. And so I think for me, like the change I want to see isn't necessarily just, isn't a black or white issue. It isn't take away all guns or, oh, I don't want to do anything. I want to keep my gun. Like it's not, it's not that simple because there are examples like in Australia, they took away all guns and it's working out for them. But I can't remember, there's like another country I think where they gave everyone a gun and it's working out for them. There are different like solutions to this problem. And I think that because all of you are such passionate people by showing up here, like all of you want something to change. And so I think by focusing on why we all want to change and focus on the feeling of like being passionate about something and about being passionate about our safety is what I think everyone is at least on the same page about. And so I think that by focusing on like, for example, for me, um, my identity is crucial to like who I am, which seems redundant obviously, but like for me, I'm a black woman. When I say I'm Maya Ramsey, like in my head, I'm thinking I am a black woman. All my experiences come from being black and a woman. And these are things that like I can't change about myself. And so I know that like, my identity shapes my own experiences and people obviously make assumptions based off how you look and so that changes people's perception about me and so but I think that like understanding other people's perspectives about gun reform and like all these other issues and I think by getting into other people's mindset and understanding why they think that way and why like their perspectives matter even if it like co like contrasts your own I think that's really important and so um, about gun reform, I just think everyone, especially students, are just fed up of feeling unsafe in our schools and are fed up of just talking about it and not seeing any action. So that's what I've heard. <laughs> Mark, you weren't kidding. Mark said Maya would be very impressive and you were on the money. Thank you very much, Maya. Jeff. Well, Joe, thank you. Prior to tonight, I have had the opportunity to meet and interact with everybody else on this panel, except for Maya. And so in the f short few minutes that we've been up here, I had a chance just to converse about her dreams, her goals, how she's uh, researching this and representing others. And her mom and dad are sitting over here, and they should be tremendously proud. <laughs> To Joe's point, why am I here tonight? I'm representing the Lincoln Police Department and the men and women of our agency. And it is crucial to what we do to be able to hear the input from all of you. And we take that input and we use it to try to place emphasis in ways that can make positive change. Because really what we're about is trying to work in this collaborative environment, preventing violence from occurring and improving the quality of life so that students that come here every day feel safe and they can, they can uh, excel in ways that we may never know. So I'll talk to you about anything and I'm curious to hear your inputs on a variety of different topics and I know that it's gonna bring about positive change. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, thanks to all of the panelists for those very uh, thoughtful and eloquent remarks. They are much appreciated. Uh, just out of curiosity, because that's kind of the way my mind works a lot of times, could every student who is here right now just stand up, whether it's elementary through college? Just stand up. I just want to see how many students are here. Thank you so much for coming. You're such an important part of this evening. Okay, um, we have an oral contract, as I recall, Dennis, and you're capable of enforcing it. I think we have discharged our part, and now it's uh, up to the audience to, uh, to do their part. Um, 
they're not doing this in Moscow tonight, or Beijing, or North Korea, or any number of other places. But we the people can do it, and we can do it here. So what we want to do is just open this up. We want the audience to be able to engage the panelists, and the panelists to be able to engage the audience. And the way this will work, we think most efficiently, is if you have a comment, if you have a thought, if you have a question, if you have an opinion that you want to express, that you want to ask of the panel, Please step up to either the boom mic over there or this one over here and just state your name. And if you represent any organization, let us know what that organization is. And let's get a conversation going. That's what this evening is about. Thank you. Folks of the moon. Here we go. Sir? Okay. Is this yes. on? Okay. Your, okay. your name and if you're representing anybody, please. Uh, Sean Nichols. I grew up in Beatrice. I recognize Dr. Joel, and don't know if you remember me from my days back then. <laughs> kind of caused You're in my office a few times. Was he in trouble? Yeah, he, <laughs> that's crazy because that's 20 years ago. <laughs> um, I like you know. I, personally, I want you to know I've turned my life around. I've served 18 and a half, actually 19 and a half years in the military, and. So I can safely say a swift kick in the uh, you-know-what from uh, him can change your life as well. <laughs> but ultimately, this is, what I hear, this is what I came here to say, and I broke it down to about four minutes of your time. Here is the harsh reality. For as long as evil has existed, evil has occurred. The only things that have changed are the means of how evil has been carried out and the increase of incidents. The Boston bomber didn't use a gun, yet was capable of killing, along with instilling a lot more widespan fear than most of the gun incidents you hear on the news today. So how do we stop it? One, you have to accept that you can't really stop people from wanting, trying to carry out what's going on in their head. There are, without a doubt, people who are born evil and will commit evil acts. History is, history is riddled with said people. From the infamous Adolf Hitler to the variety of serial killers to the simplistic Columbine killers, the Colorado Theater mass, sh uh, mass shooting, to even our local Von Mar shooter. If you look at these people's lives through documentaries and such, you'll find that efforts were made to help some of those people, but ultimately people have free will. Medicine and treatment are great ideas, and the thought that we can save everyone is a wonderful ideology, but it isn't real. The reality is that as long as a... The reality is, as long as people can neglect medication and or treatment because of his or her free will, there will be people who can be a threat to society. And once you accept number one, then you have to go to number two. The only real way to keep society, schools, and establishments relatively safe is to implement security measures to include the ability to stop and prevent worst case scenarios, usually involving firearms. And the only way to do so is to have someone ready at all times to react. History has already shown that evil cannot be prevented, but people have been stopped either before any lives were taken and or stopped before more lives could have been taken. Banning anything is not the answer. The internet has made it possible to obtain anything and everything a person set their mind to. People, are willing to take a hu people who are willing to take human lives do not care about what is on the ban list, what is illegal to buy and obtain, or if they have the legal right to buy and obtain said items or firearms. Please listen to reason and accept evil exists in our, in our society and doesn't stem from video games, music preference, and in some cases, parenting doesn't even make the difference. Some people are born evil and, are, and or with mental disorders. And even if said mental issues were addressed and treated for, can still be a threat to themselves and others because it ultimately comes to them to take their own medication with the exception of installized individuals. If you're looking for real answers, they lie in protection and training. There will always be people who want to commit harmful acts. The answers lie in having a means to protect ourselves and to teach and train how to react. A second ago, you talked about, um, we talk about safety. As a soldier deploying three times, um, you always have people that are pre-deployment and they're scared out of their mind to go overseas. The only way that you can get more confident when you go and when you have to do these kind of scenarios is train, train, train. Rather, we're talking about military or we're talking about the schools. I don't want our children to have to go to school every single day and think, oh my God, is today gonna be the day? But I want them to go to school knowing that there's a plan that no matter what, we're thinking about their health. We're, think 
were thinking about their well-being and that they can just go to school and do what they need to do to become adults and succeed in their life. With that being said, thank you so much for your guys' time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's keep this moving. Yes, sir, can you state your name and if you're representing any organization? Is anybody going to respond to what he said? You want, anybody want to respond to that? Uh, yeah, heck yeah. Okay, all right. Are you kidding? All yours. Well, just briefly, I mean, uh, I, and I do appreciate uh, his, his comments uh, and appreciate him being here and, and thank you for your service. Um, you know, you talk about, he said, he made a very interesting statement, what changes a life? And I said it earlier, as one who sits here uh, in a pastoral role, I want you all to know something. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm from the hood, okay? Just don't get it twisted, okay? <laughs> I'm from a place that is a place of violence. I'm, I lived in Ferguson. I'm from a place where people hurt each other. I grew up in that place, in a single parent situation. And, and, and for all intents and purposes, I would have been one of those persons, okay? Uh, however, I had a mother who, who made two decisions to, take me to, to send me to school and to take me to church, okay? Now, I didn't think it was making a difference, but I'm sitting here today because it's made a difference. So, so I can preach, I can talk about that sin nature as, you know, we just come out of the resurrection season, you know, in, in, in Adam all die, but in Christ all have been made alive again. Yes, I can preach that. But I, I said it earlier, the challenge, of course, you can, you can hurt people with a toothpick. It doesn't matter what device you have in your hand. The question is, what's in your heart? And the challenge at the earliest point of our lives is to get to that heart Every single person has to answer four questions. Or, one of origin, one of meaning, one of morality, and one of destiny. Everybody. And so when we, when we sit here today, we're, can we change the heart? And as, as ministers, as people of faith, we believe we can. Amen. We believe we can. And there's some people sitting here today who said, without Christ in my life, I'd be running around knocking people upside the head. But we're not. Because of the reality of the gospel. Now, again, is that a blanket statement? Is everybody going to jump on board? Not everybody. Not everybody. But as soon as we can get to people, and again, the role we can play, not just when people in the aftermath of everything, but at the earliest point where we can show the concern and care and love of Christ. Let me say it and I'll finish. The reality for all the doctrine that's been uh, prescribed and proselytized over the ages, preached over the ages. Jesus only gave us two real commands. Love God and love one another. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maya, you have a thought? Um, yeah. Also, along with being a Lincoln High student, I'm actually president of the NAACP Youth Chapter. And so, like, my time with being the leader... Of <laughs> So in my time in being like in that position, I've met so many people from many like diverse backgrounds and I've read so much and I've interacted with just people online and also in like in real life and traveling like about like guns. And so I know, like as I stated before, identity plays a major role. And I remember vividly, uh, my mother had a conversation with my brother about how to act around like police and how, like what you can do to survive. Yeah. And especially now where America is so militarized and passionate and everyone has such like free access to weapons, like it really is like, what can you do to survive? How can I change myself to survive? And that comes with suppressing your identity. It comes with conforming to like societal norms. It, can, it comes with changing who you are. And so the idea of like, I know like some people say, oh, we should arm teachers, for example. And I think that, first of all, teachers don't get paid enough already to teach us. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> and so to have them bear the responsibility of also like carrying a gun and having to decide whether or not should I kill a person, should I shoot, like that's a pretty heavy like moral obligation yeah, to put is. on someone. And so I think that like in schools having more weapons and like 
I don't know. I think I read a statistic that said that accuracy, like accuracy when shooting a gun, like in police officers in New York, was like 26% accurate. And so, like, that's a pretty low number. Oh, lower. Okay, I stand corrected. Um, and so, like, seeing that, like, okay, you're putting thousands of students at the risk of being like, of like with a person who has 18% accuracy, like, <laughs> with a gun at a high stress situation. In the case of like someone with a weapon comes no. and trying to threaten something, all these factors are extremely like psychologically like heavy that you have to carry. So you're in a high stress situation. There are students scared out of their mind. You're scared for your life. Like, how can you like think clearly and take the time to actually think out a decision of whether or not to shoot someone or to shoot a gun in general? Like. I've been around a gun like what maybe three times in my life, and each time I was like, "Oh my god, like that—that that is a gun. Like, if it's shot, like I could die. Like, I don't know. It's just an anxiety that comes with guns, especially seeing all the violence on the news and like, I don't know, just on social media in general, seeing guns and how, like, I don't know, just gun violence changes people's lives and yeah. it's oppressive and it's destructive and I don't know. A lot of people. That's why like a lot of students are scared is because you're giving people like. You're giving people the decision about whether or not another person should live, which I think no one should bear that responsibility for, you know? And so just, I understand like you want your children to be safe, but also we want to be safe too, you know? And so, I don't know, I think there could be another method in implementing security measures, but I understand your passion and your concerns. So. Thank you, Maya, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Larry Waxelman. I am with Parents United. I wanted to take a moment and recognize somebody that's uh, exhibiting in a tremendous amount of humility this evening, and that's Mr. Joe Starita. Although the panel this evening is certainly an assemblage of experts, Mr. Starita led a journalism class at the university to effectively bring change to the Pine Ridge Reservation and the alcohol problem that existed there for 20 years. They won awards over national publications, and it was an exciting day to watch that happen, both for the act laws that they won and for the change that was made. So again, thank you very much. And just very um, quickly, three of those students are, stand up just real quickly. They all won national awards for this project. Lauren, Cal, Chris, let's go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Please in, go on. In 1999, following the Columbine shooting, then Attorney General Janet Reno commissioned a group of professionals to develop a threat assessment program. They included behavioral scientists, members of the law enforcement community, educators. The list went on. They in turn said that there were several different items that went into trying to look at how and why individuals, especially students, might pose and become a threat to their students and the school system. There were several factors were identified, but the key one was that in all situations and in all instances, you have to use moderation again in how you approach threats and how seriously you can actually take them. That was 1999. Since then, social media has exploded. We have seen dramatic changes in the maturation cycle of students uh, because of the communication systems that developed. And when we talk about threat assessment, it's exciting to know that we have two national, nationally recognized individuals. But the reason Parents United opted and decided on school resource officers was not because we want an authoritarian figure walking the halls, not because we want somebody armed with a weapon walking the halls, not because we think someone in uniform is going to make a significant difference as far as visibility. What we wanted was somebody that could specialize in that threat assessment protocol so that they are progressing as change occurs because without being able to identify those new factors on a day-to-day -day basis, being able to even consider identifying the potential for a student to become behaviorally modified is even more difficult to anticipate. With that being said, 
Are there future plans? We, we realize that uh, it looks like funding may occur. We don't know how. For at least six additional officers. We know that the allocation for ramping up and delivering the ratio of to citizens in the Lincoln community has been pretty underwhelmed over the last 10 years because of budget shortfalls. We hope that those will accelerate to meet some of the demand. But in the interim period, if those six are allocated, will they be trained to the same level that these two national professionals have been? Thank you very much. Thank you. Larry, Larry good question, and I'll, I'll answer some of those, and if Perfect. Dr. Joel Fine. wants to uh, take some input. So from the threat assessment perspective, I completely agree with you. As far as a preventative measure, a way to address a threat and to prevent tragedy from occurring, I think that we can build on an already strong foundation. As Dr. Joel indicated, he has two certified threat assessment professionals that work on his staff formally with the Lincoln Police Department. We have a group that meets, it's a multidisciplinary group that meets twice every month, and we address issues like this, and it's not always to investigate them criminally. It's mostly to, to identify a problem and to try to see the friends, the family, the parents, the coworkers try to intercede and give them services that they might not have and prevent things from going further and a deeper immersion into the criminal justice system. And so will there be advanced training if we are able to uh, staff this threat assessment officer who will coordinate with Lincoln Public Schools and our staff? Absolutely. Larry, I think you moved back there. You still back? There you go. And currently there's a couple different models that are being floated around as far as improving the number of school resource officers. And I can tell you based upon conversations that I've had with elected officials, a lot of that comes back to the input that they're receiving from all of you. And today, that model looks to be six, whether it's funded by the creation of a joint public agency or through um, reallocation of existing tax dollars. I do believe that there will be momentum, and I know that there'll be part, part of uh, LPS's budget that if this goes through, it will continue to subsidize just like it does today. But you also brought up another point. School resource officers are so much more than just being a preventative measure, a uniform here. In fact, I'm sitting here tonight and I can see at least two, two school resource officers of the six that we have are not working, but they're here to, to listen to the input that all of you have. And Dave and Megan Nelson are sitting upstairs. Megan works here at Lincoln High School and Dave at North Star, and we appreciate you coming out. They want to build that trust. They want to show the human side of what policing is and hopefully open those lines of communication to intercede before something bad happens. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Ma'am, please. My name is Sarah Albright, and I'm a mom of two boys at Randolph Elementary. Um, I have a quick statement. Um, my dad was visiting this weekend, and he's a teacher. Actually, a lot of his students are at Pine Ridge um, at the reservation. And he was telling me at his small school they have no plan, no locked doors, they never practice anything. And he was very concerned. So I just want to say as a parent, thank you so much that you guys take the initiative on this and I can send my kids to school and, and feel good about it. Um, I do have a question. So I feel like a lot of the plans that I've seen and my, my son tells me about focus on building safety. And I'm wondering, do you guys have plans that extend to things outside of the building? For example, buses, um, sporting activities, things like that. We, uh, that's part of our conversation. You know, we, we know that, that this whole concept of safety and security, while we feel very comfortable with where, where we are today, um, it, it, it needs to be extended out. So things like sporting activities have come up. I, I have to tell you, there isn't a simple solution um, as of yet uh, with regard to transportation and, and buses. You know, we've done some training there. But we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take a hard look at that as we go forward. But uh, you're not the first to, to, to represent the fact that we have open doors at, at night activities and football games and basketball games and track meets. And, you know, that obviously does, does create a vulnerability. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Gina Messing Anderson. I'm a mother, four, and a wife, and I have uh, four kids in LPS, and they've been here for like 2012. And what I understand is there's 13 years with the LPS from kindergarten to graduation. That's 176 days times 13 years is 2,288 days. It's 18,304 hours that my students, my children, are putting into their education, putting into their American dream. They're doing it, I'm doing it. That's not to mention college. That's just to mention what they're required to get a high school diploma and then to go off to college, okay, another four years. So I'm putting my effort in, my children, know their demands. It's a free education, we're American. We have this great system working for us. And this is your key to get the American dream, to fight for it, to believe in it, to achieve it. And I'm here as your parent to help you achieve that. And I believe what Hillary Clinton said in 1996, it takes a village. Now, I, I'm a Republican. I don't really believe in that at the time. But I do now. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. Um, I believe that it takes all of us to believe in the American dream, to believe in our children. And if they're giving 18,304 hours for their education, we need to not put a spending lid on their education and their safety. And I have four kids, and I have like 1,300 hours left. Please help me to not like cry every day or like hold my breath when I drop my kids off, okay? I have four school runs next year. I've, ha I've invested in my ch God is first in my house, and then education, and then family. And that's the way it goes. And they know it, and I know it, and I want you to know it that my kids are dedicated to their future. But we look for you to protect them. I don't want them to be on the front lines anymore. I have 1,300 hours left of high school with two more. Come on, please help me. Please don't put a spending lid on my kids. Just give, just give. We're a village, we need each other. And if you would take a cut, 0.5% of your pay, we can fund Nebraska. We can make Nebraska number one. And, and everybody would come here because we're the safest place for their kids. And they would know it. And we can, hey. Okay, on. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Anybody want to respond to that and keep moving? Oh, I love her. Okay, all right. Yes, let's try uh, over here. Your name, please. Jane hey, hey, Kinsey. Hold on, hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second, real quick. What, what she's saying is so important. As, as one who, who, who is there for funerals, she's saying that time is ticking and time is of the essence and that we think we have a lot of time but we really don't, okay? And so she's saying, why don't we get busy and get about the work of doing what makes a difference? Someone said it, I think Corey said it earlier, if we're counting on the folks in DC, if we're counting on other people, we're not gonna get the results that affect us. So, so there is no more time for, for foolishness. It's time, as she's saying, I don't know how many hours she said you had left. It's time for something that makes a difference. And that's, and that's the inspiration I pray tonight that some of us are getting. Thank you, John. Lauren? I'm going to respond with my, I wear a lot of different hats, but as an LPS mom, um, my day started pretty early this morning, taking my son to his early morning choir practice. Um, my husband had taken my other daughter to Lincoln High for student council, and it was 
It was one of those mornings where I may or may not have rolled out of bed and just put a coat on my pajamas and driven <laughs> my son to school. And I got back home, and we have this rule that you know, we, we don't allow technology at the, at the breakfast table, at the dinner table. But no one was around, and I don't know if any of your parents do this, but we tend to break some of our own rules when you're not around. So I checked my email. And the email that was waiting for me was a notification from Principal Larson that there would be a lockdown drill today mm. at this school. And all I could think about was how heartbreaking that is, and yet how grateful I was it was just a drill. Our kids are getting prepared. They're hiding under desks, and they're being quiet, and they're looking after each other, and our teachers are helping them. And they're wondering what adults in the room are going to be doing to help get prepared. And so, to Ms. Anderson's point, we do need to be investing in our children, and we do need to come together as a community. And so, you know, just today there was a press conference with over 100 different adults in the community, adults in the room, talking about how we can form a coalition to enhance security and safety in our community. And during that press conference, I was thinking, I wonder if my, my daughter's doing her lockdown right now. Mm. Like, but it's, it's going to take all of us, and it's going to take a sustained effort. And yes, it's, it may require some investment, not just money, but time. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please. Sorry. Your thoughts? Jane Kinsey with Watchdogs of Lincoln Government. Um, with all due respect to all of these people who are here, I think we're getting away from the issue. Everybody in Lincoln, Nebraska, wants their ki children to be safe. Everybody, even children, know that there have been shootings, mass shootings, all over the United States. You would have to be deaf and dumb and without an open heart to know that this has not occurred. The big issue is not that we are going to do something. And I appreciate that uh, there are groups that are trying to do something. The, I the bigger issue is who's going to pay for this? And so what has come up in the newspaper and in the media is that there is a power grab by the mayor and by some of these people on the panel to raise taxes. And of course, when we have a uh, delicate heart, we can't possibly not think that the subject is to save students. In uh, 20 years ago, we had policemen in the schools and they took them out because they didn't think it was important. This is a different world, ladies and gentlemen. And everywhere everyone goes, they are aware that we have mass shootings in the country. So I think if this is to be a rah-rah session <laughs> to get people on the side of um, having safety in schools, that's fine. But that is not the bottom line here. There were SROs in Park, in the uh, Florida school, and they did not stop the 17 people being killed. Number one. Number two, this young person who committed this crime had been identified, referred, and attempted to stop what became a massacre for many years. The police department had been to the home over 20 times. What we need to do 
is to have an amalgamation of issues. And I want to say this, mental health is not a panacea. If there is no motivation within the person, all the mental health services are not going to stop a massacre. This young man needed intervention strongly by the law in order to stop that. So, I don't know if this is supposed to be a feel-good session. It's not. Okay. Or a then, rah-rah session. Okay, let's, let's get to the bottom line. Let's then. do. The bottom line is who's going to pay for it. I appreciate the, uh, what? Okay. Okay. Okay, are you aware, uh, you're a small minority here. <laughs> are you aware that the school system is preparing to have a bond issue? Oh, uh, to sell that? Um, they received uh, 20 uh, million dollars extra. Okay, um, I think most of the people are aware of that. So let, why don't you wrap up, please, and let's get some comments to your comments. Okay, well, that? let me finish this. Um, Quickly. I appreciate the fact that police are necessary. We agree with that. We agree mental health services are essential. But the school system and the city have money to help this kind of thing. They don't need extra um, an extra bureaucracy in order okay. to right. uh, provide money for this. Okay, thanks for sharing that. Now let's get some comments from it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jeff, take it away. <laughs> take it away. Jane, thank you very much for your comments. I think we've met a couple times before. and Yes, sir. I know you. You betcha. <laughs> And I, I just want to comment on several of the things because you've made some very great statements that, are, that everybody needs to know about. So you mentioned briefly that 28 years ago, we had more school resource officers than what we do today. And you're accurate. You are accurate. And why is that? Because there's this constant ebb and flow, emotions change, societal norms change, and that's why we have the six that we do today. But to that point, for me, that's one of the most important points in this added le level of bureaucracy. And I agree. If we could get away with not adding more bureaucracy, more red tape, we would do that. But what this JPA that was proposed earlier today, it's going to hold everybody accountable because it's going to take two members from the school board or two members from the city to make the changes to take those school resource officers out of the school, to stop funding the added component of mental health, to stop improving the community learning centers. So that's, that's one of the biggest strengths, in my opinion, to that particular model. Um, you mentioned, too, that there was a school resource officer at the school in Parkland, Florida. Absolutely, there was. And that there was what we term leakage or indicators way prior to what he did. And that's true too. And I'm not going to sit up here and make excuses for my profession. And I wish to God that it had never happened, but it did. And we need to make, we need to hold ourselves accountable within our agency and our profession. And I know the men and women of the Lincoln Police Department and of the law enforcement profession here. And I truly, in my heart, know that if something like Parkland, Florida were to happen today, those officers would be running towards that sound. The uh, JPA is a power grab. How it does uh, people sitting in leather chairs planning... Okay, let's get some comments to this. We, we, we get your point. Dr. Joel, you want to address that? Yeah, I would... I would, uh, I would follow up uh, Chief Blindmuster comment by saying this. Probably a couple of decades ago, safety and security was something that was part and parcel to what a school district produced and performed we were able to budget for. 
But in the last couple of decades, when you think about all of the issues that society has had to contend mm -hmm. with, where do they land for addressing it? It's at the doorstep of the schools. Why? Because we have the future of the American democracy in our midst every single day. And the truth of the matter is, we cannot do it alone. So I want to say this. While there, there's apparent, there will be disagreement, the reality of it is, it's taking all of us, it takes this wonderful community that cares so deeply about our young people, for them to be successful, we can't do it alone. We don't have the resources. And today, we unveiled a plan that represents a community-based solution to address these critical issues. And I'm so proud of the people that came together and worked eight years on this. And the reality of it is, we're gonna become a stronger school system, a stronger community, and the kids leaving us are gonna go off and do wonderful things and have happy and successful lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. We need to move on. We need to move on. Hey, Joe. Joe. This is, people listen to what's really going on. There are a lot of people waiting to speak. Yeah, I just want to add, you know, Ms. Kinsey, I think one of the really important things you bring to all of our public conversations is that we have to be mindful of the impacts uh, on people on fixed incomes and people in our community who are living in poverty and that we have to be sensitive to the costs of every in Denver. Um, what, but I think what we're talking about with this proposed joint public agency isn't about a power grab, it's about empowering people who have raised their voices and called for priority on school safety and our kids' success. And the mechanism is just that. It's a way of actually requiring that leaders from the school district and leaders from the city sit down face to face and govern together and share power over their decision making for the betterment of our kids. And there is not an intention to, to raise new revenue, but to prioritize revenue. A JPA creates a dedicated funding source for the services that this community is calling for. In the past when there are SROs, the funding for that could be taken away and put towards other important priorities. It's something we have to do in every budget cycle is weigh really important community priorities. But a JPA offers a special sort of almost a, a special isolated revenue stream that will help perpetuate this priority in our community. And when you make that kind of a commitment and make that kind of a priority, people notice and the potential to attract further private investment from the philanthropic community is there. The, the ability to get private dollars involved increases. It also comes with not just more governance but heightened transparency. There is a light shining brightly on those meetings and they're public. And I'd say lastly that, you know, we've had JPAs in Lincoln. We've had JPAs to help us be entertained, to grow our economy with the arena. We've had a JPA to build a jail to try and protect ourselves from those who choose to break the law. Why not a JPA to invest in the future security and success of our children? Okay. One, one last thing. One of the yeah, next. Next. I'll go ahead first. Well, I just want to say quickly, uh, when we had our community conversations with the Chief Bleimeister and the, the staff of the Lincoln Police Department, our, our goal w was something that money had, didn't have anything to do with. We were talking about relationships. You know, we talk about being a community. We talk about how a young man like this can, can, can kind of navigate uh, alone, be in his room all by himself. You know, I grew up in a time where I wasn't afraid of the police. I was afraid of the mothers in the houses right next to me. Okay? And so, so it doesn't cost anything to see a kid who seems to be isolated, whose parents may have just gotten divorced, or whatever the situation might be. We used to have guys who would come around us, these older guys, and they would put their arms around us and say, hey, young blood, I see you were by yourself. What's going on? That don't cost anything. And so we can, we can look up here and say, well, it's the city council's fault. It's the school district's fault. No, it's our fault. It's our fault. If we don't get it, we go into our homes, we go into our silos, and we turn on our spectrum or our dish or whatever it is we have, 
and we don't know each other and we don't communicate and we wonder why kids are the way they are. Because they're in isolation. We're in tougher times today for young people than many of, I'm 56, it's tougher than when I was a kid. And then we go out and we buy them Call of Duty and they sit in their room and they play it and play it and they become desensitized to life. And then we wonder why. Come on. Exactly. Having a relationship doesn't cost us anything but a little time and a conversation with a young person or even an older person who might be struggling. Thank you, John. Thank you. Corey's got a comment, and then we'll get to the next question. Two things. I appreciate your remarks, uh, Pastor. The thing is, I can't parent other kids. You know, I, I, one of my greatest assets is I coach. I think my, one of the greatest things I do is coach midget football. Yeah. And because I get to reach those kids. I've done that. But I can't go drag some kid out of his house that's playing Xbox. I can't go, go. When parents say, you know what we need? We need better parenting. Yep. Yeah, what do you want me to do? How, how am I going to get that person to be a par better parent? That kid that shot those kids in Florida, do, well, how am I supposed to make be a better parent from Nebraska? I don't know. If I could, I'd fly down there and do it because I don't want those 17 kids de dead. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's great. That's a great sound bite. We just need better parenting. Yeah, I'm doing a great job. So I, why don't you people do a better job? And I mean that, you know, <laughs> to a point, the people that we need to do a better job, they're not sitting here tonight. You know, I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I represent some bad people. There are evil people out in this world. And you know what? They're evil people. They're evil. These evil people, they'll turn, their children go to school with you. That's a reality. We've had evil people in this world oh, forever. since... Since the beginning. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? There's going to be evil people tomorrow, and there's going to be evil people when we're all gone. The, the other thing I wanted to say about the taxes... Uh, that's a heck of a segue. Uh, <laughs> Parents United, we, we, we support school resource officers in every school. And once it, we're all together, and, and you know, I, t I talked to you about how we're all united, and then, what, then we got to the part about paying for it, and I joked that I was going to change the name to Parents Kinda United after we got to that part. That's the hard part, isn't it? <laughs> um, I did not endorse or sign my name up or my group's name up to the mayor's plan. And it just so happened that Roy Christensen came in and spoke to us Tuesday night after he learned about the plan. And he was pretty convincing to some of the group about why we should oppose that. Now, I want to give the mayor a fair shot and bring somebody in to say, here's the pros of it. Uh, so we can have a discussion, and I think the public should have a discussion, if we're going to add these school resource officers, uh, how it's best to be paid for. Mm -hmm. Our number one concern is we want a school resource officer in every junior high. And if you do the JPA, there's a lid on that. You're going to be sitting at $2 million, and you've just spent the entire $2 million. And so next year, if the program is so successful, you've already maxed out your $2 million. You have nowhere to grow. So that is one of our big concerns. Thank you. Okay, all right, let's, very good. Uh, thank you, Corey. Uh, let's move on and uh, uh, please be as concise as you can. There's a lot of people. I've heard that. And yeah. you know what? When I have a kid, when, when I, I had a kid who came over to our house and broke the window and he's involved in drugs. You know what happens? There's two, one or two things that are going to happen. Either, either that kid's going to rise up or my kid's going to go down. And you know what happens often? Often your children goes down. How many people say, hey, go hang out with that kid that, that's involved in drugs? Okay, all right. You two can get, you're going to talk afterwards. You're gonna Sounds like a, a conversation you're afterwards, share I'll tell you that. Meet Sunday afterwards and get that resolved. Yes, ma'am. Keep Meet it Corey in the hallway. as concise as possible. Yes. Um, my name is Christy, and my kids have already graduated from Lincoln Public Schools, and um, someday I'm going to have grandkids, you know, hopefully not soon, but, um, you know, I, I will, and, and they will probably attend LPS. Um, 
I, I'm going to try to get through this without getting emotional. Get emotional. Don't worry about it. Um, one of the big issues that I wanted to talk about, and I'm just going to say a couple things, and then I'm going to read a couple things I wrote down, and that's it. Um, no matter how many resource officers you have, no, ma no matter how many metal detectors you have, no matter how much extra staff you have, does not stop bullying. Okay? And when a child is getting bullied, that more than most likely, most often, is what causes a mental illness. No, I'm saying, I'm saying making that child, if a child is getting bullied, and it, it brings the child down. It makes them, yeah. you know, when, when the school is not helping that child and the parents are not, you know, if, if they're not working together to help that child, you know, and, and people are bullying them, you know, and they're going to, the child, is, every, every, everybody can only get to a breaking point, yeah. you know, when, when they're... No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when a child gets bullied, I mean, everybody's saying, oh, mental health, mental health, these people are crazy. Well, yeah, if somebody's bullying you, you're going to act crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I, I'm not using that as an excuse, but I'm just going to tell you my story and we go from there and leave it at that. Okay, can we do um, this really okay, quickly? Okay. You can see yes. the number of people behind okay. you want to talk. I want to get as I'm many voices as we can, okay. so please, quickly. I'm speaking on behalf of my family, my children, and all the other families that have had to deal with bullying. <laughs> my children are both graduated, like I said. Um, one of my, ch my child had to deal with bullying severely, severely bad, with no help from LPS or their school. These are our children. We are keeping them in your hands during the day. Some key points I have questioned about. Zero tolerance bullying. It's not being enforced. It's not being enforced. When other students bullied my child during class over social media, for one, why do they have their phones in class? Why is that rule not being enforced? They should not be in the middle of class on their phones. It was brought to the principal's attention. The principal told the man, the young man that was bullying my child, just take it down. They need to be brought to the office. They need to say, hey, what's going on? Give me your phones, period. Go back to class. Stop. Okay, got to make this as far as, as, I just, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I went, I, I, I approached the school with this issue, and I talked to uh, Hunter Pirtle, and I asked him, I said, what can we do about the bullying problem? And he said, well, there was a lady that we used to work with um, a while back, she works at the university, and, you know, but nobody came. Why can't you, you know, incorporate this where it's mandatory? You know, even before the school year starts, you know, like you, it's physically, you want to make things mandatory for people to get physicals on with their kids and things like that. But what about mentally having them, you know, be taught, educate them on bullying, educating them on what it does and okay, what it does. Okay, I think we get your point. Let's get a response to this. We've got okay, a lot of people here. I just wanted to say that Susan uh, Spur is at UNL. I have her phone number and her email. It, that is a, a great person that I, I spoke with at, at UNL that said she was more than willing to work with LPS as far as bullying goes. You know, I just think there needs okay. to be more okay. done as far All as right. bullying goes. Okay. I mean, we, we right. can't let these kids do this. It's, it's, it's horrible. And, and on the internet, and on, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. And, and a lot of people don't realize how horrible, because I, I don't want to, you know, I'm the one who has to pick up my daughter, you know, and cry, listen to her cry every night because she's getting okay, bullied Okay, I think we get your point. Thank you for okay. sharing it. Katie, would you like to respond to that? Thank you for sharing it. Thank you. Christy, Katie? thank you for sharing your situation, and um, unfortunately, it's not unique. Uh, I'd like to say a couple things about bullying and also about mental health. 
Um, Dr. Swearer is a great resource. I know LPS has used her, and, and there's likely plans that, uh, to continue to work with her closely, and she's a national expert in this. Um, I also know that hurt people hurt people. And so while the person who is bullied needs support, they need a sense of belonging, they need the adults, they need their peers to come around them, we also need to pay attention to the student who is perpetrating the bullying because there's something going on there. Um, you know, a couple of things could be happening, I mean many things, but there's something going on at home, or maybe we have a, a school climate where it's tolerated. You know, there's so many variables. Um, but it's really serious, and as a mom, um, and many of you are parents, to see your child hurt is just one of the worst things that can happen. Um, but at the same time, there's so many lessons that can happen as a result of it. We need to help all of our kids learn how to treat each other well. We need to help kids who are bullied. We need to help kids that do bully. Um, and it can cause, for some kids, a lot of anxiety. Um, it can cause depression. Uh, bullying is not causal of mental health. It can exacerbate some issues that might already be there. Um, and we need a lot of support around the issue. But it needs the adults, it needs the students, it needs the community to not tolerate it. And um, for Maya and other brave students to stand up to kids and say, it's not okay here, we don't do that at Lincoln High, we don't do that at whatever school we're at. So, just a couple thoughts. Thank you, Katie, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm here as a taxpayer from Lincoln. I actually live really close to Lincoln High and see the kids here all the time. Um, I am also a researcher, and one of the things that I research is how organizations use data in their decision making. And so my question is, since we have a natural experiment, there were officers in schools prior to the recession, and then since then there have not been as many. What does the data look like between those two periods in terms of referrals for discipline, and entry into the juvenile justice system. Be I'm not done, because the data from other districts shows that, that disproportionately impacts children of color. I, I, have, I have been waiting for this question. I have loved it. Yes, let's talk about Corey, this. Corey, why don't you respond? You have some studies. You have some studies from the different states, and you have studies from the, and, uh, of Nebraska. Do you know what the studies will show? If you look at Lancaster County, it used to be we'd have 50 to 60 kids locked up in Lancaster detention. But thanks to those county attorneys that are sitting right there that who do not believe in locking up kids. You know how many is in juvenile detention today? Do you believe 30. in locking up children? Uh, hold on, 13. There's, there's 13 kids. Let him finish, let him there's finish. Listen to me. Our county attorney does not believe in locking up children. They have diversion program after diversion program to keep them out. They, so, so the whole system works like that. So when you, everybody says they're disproportionately targeting minorities, I have facts. And I have the head county attorneys back there, the assistant county attorneys right there, and the juvenile county attorneys right there. If you want to know about the truth, ask them because Where the is a report for the public to see of this I, data? I, I agree. We should get that out because I have Please. full confidence that we are going to be right on that. Okay. <laughs> Can I speak to that really quick? Like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Maya. Okay, um, response, please? as a black person growing up in LPS, um, I've definitely faced quite a bit of racism from students and teachers. I vividly remember in middle school, after school, I was with my friends, like they were all black. Um, and so a teacher came up, we were sitting like near the media center, so it was kind of like in this hallway, whatever. And then she says, oh, your people always linger around here. And I was like, what? And I was like, what do you mean, like, my people? And she's like, oh, you know, your people. She goes, you guys always, like, loiter around here and hang out. But we were, like, waiting. I was waiting for my dad to pick me up because I had the orchestra after school. And so, like, 
Microaggressions like these are so common, like you don't even understand. Even from people, like they don't even realize what their actions like convey to you and how that impacts like your own identity. I keep talking about identity, but it, obviously it's really important. And so like the idea that like, okay, yes, like people of color are being locked up disproportionately, but also like even when they're not being locked up, those actions taken, the words that are said, those are psychologically like impacting people of color. And that's what's putting, that's what's setting people back. And so, like, back to what I was saying about, like, assumptions that are made based off of how you look. Like, I don't think, like, a lot of you guys realize, like, how important skin color is and, like, how important what you look like is. Because I've been, like, stopped. Like, like my friends have been stopped. I've been stopped. I've been followed around in malls because people think I'm stealing, even though why would I want Dillard's? It's cheap stuff. Anyway, it's my um, Like... I don't know, the amount of times where, like, because of what I look like, like, people have been treating me differently and have been, like, restricting me from getting opportunities than if, if I were, like, if I weren't who I was. Like, the idea that, like, I don't know, there's this inherent kind of internalized racism that everyone has because that's the way society is. It's in our systems, it's taught in our schools. Like, if you look at, like, even little things as like how something is worded, that conveys a certain like idea in people's minds. And the buildup of that over years and years and years of education, like that's what it's like boiled down to is the incarceration of people of color disproportionately. And like just like more punishment and just discouragement and like I don't know, I have an aunt who teaches in Georgia and she says that people never encourage like the black students to go to college. You never hear, oh, are you like you're gonna go to college, so this is what you need to do. It's always, oh, like I don't know, what do you, like, oh, I see, like, you're loitering around in the hallway again, like, you need to go get to class, whatever. It's always condescending tone. And so the importance of, like, acknowledging what your actions and your words and how they impact others, that's what's important. And so, just to answer that. Thank you, Mara. Um, okay, John, quickly. Every year in uh, Kearney, Nebraska, and I don't know if any of the educators here get a chance to, um, as, because I, I own my own business and because I, 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 I'm a past, I have a different kind of schedule, uh, I get to go to this conference. Oh, matter of fact, I make myself go because I want to know what our educators are talking about. Uh, my first session last year was called uh, Combating the Preschool to Prison Pipeline. That's right. And so, Sarah, to your point about research and about the conversation about what it, what it means and again, it was clear that the disproportionate number of, of young people of color who were being dealt with as early as preschool, suspended, some even expelled. Now again, there are all kinds of mitigating factors. And I think that's one of the challenges we have, is we, we're, looking, we're looking at the, the end, but we have to kind of rewind and figure out, how did we get here? How did we get to this point? Was it bullying? Was it parenting? Is it social society? Is it movies? Is it all the influences that have gotten us to this point? We're looking at the end. What's at the beginning? And, and how can we rewind the tape and begin to work our way to the point where we actually have real and solid resolutions to some of the issues that have gotten us to this point? Thanks, John. Uh, thank you. Uh, anybody else want to comment briefly on uh, I, I'd Katie? I'd like to comment briefly. Um, I think while uh, how we deal with individuals of color is critically important, I think we can't just keep our focus there. Our, we need to be, have a broader view, and that includes others. Um, that includes the LGBTQ community. That includes uh, people with disabilities, people on the autism spectrum. I mean, there's so many ways that people are differently able, that are expressing themselves differently, gender identity, and so we, we need to be sensitive to all of those, those differences. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, comment please. And again, who was the last person to, to ask the question? Sarah. Sarah. Sarah, back there. Sarah, if you would, can you get with me afterwards? And I'm going to share some research that's been done here locally. It's called Project Restore. And it has some pretty compelling data that I know that you would like to take a look at. And it also emphasizes some of the efforts and the cooperation that we talked about here between Lincoln Public Schools, between the Lancaster County Attorney's Office and the Lincoln Police Department. And we recognize Disparity exists. Disparity exists in the criminal justice system, and I'm certain that it does in all facets of uh, punitive um, 
procedures within LPS and school systems across the nation. And we need to do better. And, and, when, we, and when we have these studies and people pay for money for all these different studies, would you make them public? That's the thing we have. Joe Kelly told me to my face that they did a, they had a researcher, they had a big group, research group come in to see if there was disparity in our adjudication of cases. And, and it was a big, thick report. And I'm asking, I'm wondering, who here saw it? Did anybody see it? No. Well, we have Barbara saw it, but most of us didn't see it. And so we're spending this money on these different reports, and some of them are favorable in terms of the fact that it didn't, it, we didn't see any great disparity in some regard. But again, people are going to assume what they do not know. And if you don't know, you're just going to assume whatever is real. If we're going to spend money, whether you're the city council, the public defender's office, I don't care what office you're in, let the people know what you found out. So at least we can have a conversation. Thank you. You've been extraordinarily patient. Thank Please. You. Very short. My name is Paul Smith. I'm here representing my conscience. I'm also a husband. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. A father and a teacher here in LPS. <laughs> my conscience. And 34 years. And I just, I just want to challenge the panel, challenge the people here. I think two things are missing tonight. Um, no particular order. One is a little bit of decorum. And what I mean by that, please listen. Tomorrow's Friday. And in my Holocaust literature class on Fridays, we have a thing called Friday Forums. And I'm going to have 32 seniors in my seventh period and 29 in my third period. And they're going to have papers and I'm going to bring up topics and issues. And one of the rules I set at the beginning of every semester is I don't care what you believe in as long as you know what you believe in and why. And, and we got to practice decorum. we got to practice listening. And those kids, no matter what you think, they're looking at us. We're the role models. We can do better. And I'm going to challenge the groups here. Kids' voices, this young lady is amazing. More kids' voices are needed here. And for you folks out there, our two kids went through the system here. That's what brought us here 21 years ago. We packed up my family and we moved here because of the school, because of the community. It, it's inviting. We resettle refugees. We love people. And I will guarantee you two things. I will love your black child. I will love your gay child. Your transgender, your Democrat, your Republican. And I will lay it out there for you. I will not carry a gun. And I will not teach in a school with a metal detector. Thank you. Paul, thank you and your conscience. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, my name's Matt. Uh, I'm a student here at Lincoln High, a senior. And, uh, and I hope to bring an alternate perspective into this topic. Uh, according to the Crime Prevention Research Center, 98% of mass shootings occur in gun-free zones. Simply, criminals don't follow the rules. This is why they are criminals. On March 20th of this year, an armed resource officer stopped a mass shooting at Great Mills High School in Maryland, as reported by Sienna. Okay, let him go, let him go. Just let him talk. You'll get your chance. Okay, but let him finish. All right, let him finish. With this in mind, is the city government, in coordination with LPS, considering increasing the armed officer presence in the, not just a few, but all of our schools. And in case funding sh falls short, uh, grant to carry licenses to trained individuals on staff. For example, would you consider employing veterans at lower cost to pass who pass psychological evaluations and undergo proper training to defend our schools? Okay, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thank you. You want to respond to that? Got a yes, I, I will. Um, I appreciate young man's point. We're, we're not, as a school district, ready to have that conversation at this point. We're still, as I've mentioned, we're, we're undergoing a comprehensive review of, of all of our safety and security. Personally, I, I'm, I'm struggling with more guns in school as opposed to less guns in school, and I know that that's, that's a point of debate. Um, but we, we, are, we are doing our due diligence as, as we're working through this very complex and complicated process. 
Thank you. Okay, we just heard about decorum. We want to get some more voices, please. More, more young people. Hi, everybody. Um, I am the second consecutive Paul on this side. <laughs> and um, I'm actually a, a member of a demographic here that's been talked about a lot, but nobody's really heard from. I am white, male, mentally ill, I am autistic, I am awkward, I am a shut-in, and I love my violent video games. <laughs> and what I have to say is that we have a problem. We have a problem with guns. And I'm gonna say some things about this. I'm gonna say some things about this, but everything I say here, I want you to think about what we can do and how we can use this. Our, the eyes of not just, you know, Lincoln, the eyes of Nebraska are on this room right now. We are the capital state. We are an example of the best this city, this state, ha and I would even say this country has to offer. We are generous. We are kind. We are a loving community. So everything we do here in this room and everything we take out of it, we need to be willing to make an example of that and carry that everywhere we go. Teachers, parents, students, officers, we need to provide a united front and put pressure on the legislature, the leaders of our communities, to work together to put a stop to all of this. Now, I hear a lot about protecting schools, and I apologize if I'm shaking. Like I said, I'm mentally ill, I'm autistic. This is a personal hell for me being here right now. So, I apologize if I'm getting a little shaky. Everyone talks about protecting schools, protecting schools, resource officers, more after school programs. I think mental health is a great issue to address. One, you know, sorry. You're okay. You're all right. Only two to three percent of all violent crimes are committed by mentally ill people. Everybody else, completely healthy. Mentally ill people are more likely, you know, 10% more likely than anybody else to be the victim of violent crime. So while I think mental health is an excellent item to discuss, it is not what we need to be talking about right now. Guns. What happens when our students, when our children leave the school building? After school programs only serve to make that one Fort Knox safer. When Maya graduates and is no longer in school, is she no longer worth protecting? What happens when our children leave the school building? We have a bigger problem in this state. We need to stop people's access to guns. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people will say here, Second Amendment, very, very important. And I agree. Like I said, I love violent video games. I think guns are very interesting. So one thing to know about this is the only justification I've ever heard for why people might need to have a semi-automatic weapon in the home is so that they can protect themselves if an unjust government comes to shut them down. Well, I'm going to tell you something about shutting down an unjust government. So, the longest recorded sniper shot in history was just a little under 2.25 miles. That would be, so you give Usain Bolt, the fastest man on earth, a semi-automatic rifle, and pit him against that sniper using an American-made sniper rifle, it would take him Eight minutes of constant running to get into range of fighting back. The only people that owners of semi-automatic rifles would reasonably be able to fight against would be the other people who love semi-automatic weapons. You're not going to shut down an unjust government with a gun. The only thing you're going to do is have something that can be stolen by a person who is angry, who wants to hurt other people. Our students are important when they are in school, when they are out of it, when they are no longer students. The only thing we can do is to make a united front, parents, teachers, non-teachers, members of the community, you know, faith and otherwise. We need to put a freaking stop to this. This is ridiculous. Nobody needs a semi-automatic rifle. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. 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 Let's get to some more comments. Thank you, Paul, for having the courage to get up there and, uh, and just speak. Thank you, Paul. Um, Thank you. And now uh, we have... Morgan Madsen. Say again. Morgan Madsen. Morgan is... Madison? Yes. And you are how and old, Morgan? I am a 15-year-old. I am in ninth grade. And I go to Southeast, and I also attend the Science Focus program. 
I would just like to speak my mind um, as a student. I believe that this is not an issue for any one group of people. This is a national issue. This can't be pointed, you can't point fingers at who did it. There's not one group of people who has been proven to shoot more often than others. This, and I think that this can be helped by, in all, reducing the weapons. What I do when I don't want my brother to get candy, I put it somewhere where it's not accessible to people. <laughs> <laughs> this, and this, this can be done with guns. It's been shown that you can take people's guns away. <laughs> the government, other, gov other, other governments have done it, like Australia. And I don't think that every gun needs to be taken away. I, I actually have gone out hunting with my grandparents, but I do not believe that everyone must own an automatic weapon. And in all honesty, I feel that guns in schools make me more uncomfortable to go to school. Um, many of my teachers that I've talked to, they are wonderful. And I believe that they deserve every single penny that they are earning. Um, and much more. <laughs> but many of them say that they are not okay with carrying guns. And I think that it should be their decision whether they want to carry one mm -hmm. or not in our schools. And it should also be our decision as students on whether we are okay with this. And there are many different points of view and perspectives. I believe that we will really get there if we all work together, if we all figure something out together. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Yes, sir. You've been patient as well. Your name? My name is Gerald Jensen. I'm with uh, Parents United. First of all, I would like to be up here and say something warm and fuzzy about the SROs in my experience. I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was lucky. I've been in the Lincoln. I was in the Lincoln Public School System from 1968 until 1981. I graduated from Northeast High School. In the early years, I went to McPhee Elementary School. At that time, we had resource officers in the elementary schools. I had the wonderful experience at McPhee of having a resource officer named Officer John Ways. Thank you. There he is back there. Put your hand up, John. Stop looking around. <laughs> The resource officer program is community policing at its best. We are not looking for an adversarial relationship here. These officers were mentors, they were life coaches, they helped work with kids, they established relationships with kids, and they established lifelong friendships with kids. Officer Ways, I would consider you a friend to this day. Thank you very much for your service to your community. On a second note, we've had an incident at Southeast High School within the last couple of weeks where there was hallway C has became a focus point of a lot of things that have happened. There's suspicion that there was a fight that happened in hallway C that spilled into the streets and caused a homicide in the city of Lincoln. As a member of Parents United, it has come to my attention that there, by a number of people, there are more than one incident happening in Hallway C at Southeast. I'm not the only person that, is, that has been made aware of this. I've talked with other people, and Hallway C is a real problem. It's a dangerous place to be. And I would like to talk with, I would like the, some members on the panel to talk about, is there some friction between the police and the, and the school that is causing them for the police not to be able to go in and take control and, and do something necessary that needs to be done in hallway C to get the gangs out of there. 
And that's all I have. Thank you much. Okay. Uh, Jeff, I'll, I'll start. Uh, Gerald, Jeff, thank start you. Addressing that. Thank you for uh, addressing multiple things. And during the course of these conversations as they've come about through our community, I don't know that I've ever personally met John Ways, <laughs> but your name continues to resonate as a positive influence in so many people's lives, and you're to be commended for that. In the same manner, the six school resource officers that we currently have that are assigned to the high schools, including Southeast High School, Gerald scampered away here, I don't know where he went, there he went. And I can tell you firsthand that they take a similar mindset to what John did back then, in that they are so involved with the lives of the kids and just trying to make a positive impact, positive relationships, building, building lines of communication but sometimes their roles change. And they become, they try to prevent these altercations that occurred. And there, it's no secret, I've spoken publicly, the Lincoln Police Department has spoken publicly, as has Lincoln Public Schools, that there were fights that preceded the, the tragic death of Edgar Union a couple weeks ago. Now, that was not the first and many of those events that transpired that ultimately led up to that particular incident where he lost his life occurred within the boundaries of the schools, southeast, within the boundaries of our community. And I don't, I've heard the sim similar things because different people have come forward to me and are asking me about this riff or lack of cooperation between Lincoln Public Schools and the Lincoln Police Department. And to the contrary, I see the work of Joe Wright and John Sundemeyer sitting in a conference room, spending hours talking about the different interplay of the events that led up to that death and which have followed, and the plans that they're making based upon the tools that both our agency have, which are different than what LPS has, and that cooperation is just outstanding. And so I'm not seeing that. I don't hear about that, and I've asked, I've asked pointed questions. Our missions overlap and intertwine so much. Do we have some differences? Absolutely we do. But overall, that level of cooperation, as a parent of a senior in a public high school, I know that they're there to do the best that they can, both the school district and the Lincoln Police Department. And I, and I would... I would merely add to that by saying that our ability to bring in both Joe Wright and John Sundermeyer and, and other people, former officers that have worked for LPD and are now working for Lincoln Public Schools is a tremendous benefit in us bringing our two worlds a little bit closer. And as, as you mentioned, Chief, every incident that we have, while regrettable, is an opportunity for us to step back and assess and make recommendations, but I can assure you, just as Chief Blymeister did, the cooperation between Lincoln Public Schools and the Lincoln Police Department is genuine, it's real, and it's quite impressive with regard to how we coordinate and we try to address these issues of mutual concern. Thank you. Corey, Mr. Raymond? Just real quick, I have a question. That to the kids in here. Who's all heard of high, who's all heard about Hallway C at Southeast? Okay, I'm just asking those people up here on the stage to look at that. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, we only got about five minutes left, and we got plenty of people who want to talk. So we, you can talk into individual groups uh, afterwards about Hallway C if you want to. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Alicia Mackling, and I'm a mom of a kindergartner um, at Saratoga Elementary. And I just want to say, you know, it's been a really eye-opening experience seeing how, you know, our, the teachers at our school in particular are just real superheroes. You know, they're working with kids in really um, low-income situations, and they have some great programs to try to help these kids become great young ladies and gentlemen. So I really applaud LPS for everything you're doing. Um, I was really glad to see that the city council took some action recently with um, bump, the bump stock ban. Um, thank you.
But even in light, in light of that, I would really like to ask you folks up here to take this very important moment and be extremely honest with the people that you're serving. I think parents and community members need to hear the uncomfortable truth that frankly, there will never be enough money awarded to adequately fortify our kids in their schools, that there will never be enough money available to address mental health, that bullying will always exist to some degree, and that teachers and other personnel already have an overloaded plate and that it's not uh, realistic or frankly a socially responsible expectation for schools alone to bear the burden of taking um, a defensive stand against mass shooters. All the while we have lobbyists and lawmakers in our own state trying to make it easier to access guns to take them everywhere and anywhere as well as continued attempts to limit local government's ability to enact and maintain their own stricter gun safety measures and deal with gun violence happening in their homes and on their streets. I ask you to be outspoken about the fact that when the state budget gets tight, that schools are the first target of taxpayers and politicians to make cuts, which is exactly the case of the Downsized Resource Officer Program at LPS not that long ago. When we talk specifically about what could be accomplished by either raising additional fun funds via taxes or diverting funds away from the already stretched school and police budgets, one proposal I've read is that these options would only add approximately six resource officers, which was verified up here today. So under this proposal, it's my understanding that there would still be at least 60 Lincoln schools left without, and that just doesn't make any sense to me. As a parent of kids who spend most of their day at, at um, on campus before and after school pro uh, programs and their regular school day, I desperately do not want to see programs, curriculum, personnel, or supply cuts to support a spotty expanded resource program, officer program that frankly lacks evidence of consistently preventing or stopping school shootings. We know they didn't at real life exam examples including Columbine, Virginia Tech, and Stoneman Douglas. Um, I don't believe that these short term fixes address the root problem of gun violence which is caused by easy access to guns and a lax cultural attitude of what constitutes a responsible gun owner. There is this prevalent attitude that the majority of gun owners are responsible and, the, and that a few bad apples are anomalies that were either failed by the system, which I don't even know what that is, or that parents did not do their job. It's this attitude in itself that needs to be readjusted. I would like to see schools in conjunction with our law enforcement, with local, state, and federal government working together to create a movement to focus on education about gun violence and what being a responsible gun owner and user should look like. Okay, thank you. I think we've got to keep moving on. We get the point. Thank you very much. Um, anybody want to address that or should we keep moving? Keep moving. We've got time for about one question. Amen. Maybe two. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, good evening. I'm Patrick Conway. Proud to be a member of Parents United. Um, we mentioned a few minutes ago the murder that happened uh, from that started the fight at Southeast and spilled to the streets and, and culminated in a, a horrible murder uh, that happened just blocks from Calvert Elementary School. The way I understand it, Calvert Elementary School is a school that has a secure entrance due to the fact that they have some semi-retired person who sits at a desk and tries to let people in. Um, but the way I understand it, it does not have um, enough of a security system that has a, a, double chain, a double door locking system, the way I understand it. Had that person decided to take his gun after murdering someone else, demonstrating wanton disregard for human life, mm -hmm. and he had decided to go those two blocks towards the school, can anybody on the panel explain to me how a CLC or a guidance counselor or any of these other wonderful, happy, feel-good programs would have stopped that person in the who knows how long it would take for one of Lincoln's finest to arrive on scene? Well, clearly, we're not going to be able to give you the answer that you, you're looking for. But again, I'll, I'll point back to the fact that we, we have those mechanisms in place. We are the, the people that we have responsible for security and safety at every single one of our almost 60 buildings are trained in, in some form, some manner of threat assessment. And 
the, the notification of authorities, the police department, is instantaneous, and the response time is very impressive. Can you give me any better things than instantaneous and very impressive? Well, instantaneous would be that's the training. As soon as we identified a threat, a notification is made, and a contact is made with uh, the police department. And, and the response time from the police department, based on our experiences, has been, has been exceptional. It's 11 minutes. That's the average response time for the Lincoln Police Department, as Chief Blymeister. Um, uh, I can comment on that, Corey. Could I, could I just finish real quick? Sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> my son goes to Calvert. I tell, my, I tell my kids, you know, if there's an active shooter, it's 11 minutes. You have to survive for 11 minutes. You have to hide out. You have to run for 11 minutes. That ain't right. Thank you, Chief. I think what Corey's referring to, I think, is there is a, uh, a benchmark that we use to measure ourselves. So we talk about data, and the Lincoln Police Department uses data all the time to measure different matrices. One is response times to what we'll call priority zero, one, and two calls any kind of crime in progress is what we're measuring our response to. And so what the benchmark is, is that we are going to respond from the minute 911 is called to the minute an officer re arrives, is we want to be able to get the, to those calls within, within 10 minutes. So that is the goal. Now, where this 11 minutes comes to, I don't know, and this varies with every particular incident, but I want to provide a couple quick examples. From the minute, there was a disturbance at Lincoln High School a few weeks ago, it's probably a month ago now. And from the minute we were notified of that, within two minutes, two minutes, there were six Lincoln police officers that were here. In <laughs> fact, there were students from Lincoln High School that took the time out of their day, students that called me and said, thank you. Thank you for your officers as we saw them running into that particular building. I'm confident that was in response to the negative actions or the inaction that was in Parkland, Florida. But yet they wanted to compliment the men and women and that's why I'm so confident that if that tragedy were to occur here, that would be the response as they would run towards that. Now, we'll take the incident on South 47th. We had, I, I can't tell you exactly, but there were multiple, multiple units that arrived within four minutes of that incident happening there. Is it going to vary? It absolutely is, based upon the geographic expanse of this growing community, and it's something that we're very cognizant of and will continue to work towards. But to, uh, I can't remember her point, she's right. There's no amount of money that any of us are ever going to be able to spend that is going to adequately place a school resource officer in every school to staff all of these different things. So we have to approach it with a multifaceted approach, similar to the context of what is being proposed today. And I think it is going to make an impact. I truly believe that. Oh. To, put, to put it in context, yeah, it's not just the cost. It's not just the cost. It would cost about uh, eight to ten million dollars annually every year. Okay. The good thing about the debate is, is everybody has, it's the community's expectations. It really is. And your conversations with the decision makers, similar to here today, they're hearing your input. They are. Thank you. Okay, we got, we got, time, for, we got time for one more question. This uh, lady has been very patient. Uh, please, can you state your name? And Hi, my name is Melody Vaccaro. And I have a friend named Sarah Daughter Fur, and she died in January. And she started her activism to bring Milkworks into Lincoln because she believed in the value of babies. And the second part of her activism was worrying about guns because she believed that children are worth saving. And 
with her and with a bunch of other people in the community, we started Nebraska Against Gun Violence. And her number one thing, and I am going to ask all of you tonight, everybody here either owns guns or you know somebody who owns guns. Do you know how you stop children from having guns and bringing them to school? Lock up your guns. Lock them up. Lock them up. Hold gun owners in this community to a higher standard. We had a kindergartner in Grand Island brought a handgun in their backpack. Kindergartners can't access guns unless somebody leaves one around. 17-year-olds can't access guns unless someone leaves one around. Tom Cassidy, he tweets almost every day about a handgun in a car. Lock up your guns. Tell everyone you know to lock up their guns. We have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. We should legislate it at the city council level. But even if we don't do it, we can still make this happen and change the community norm. And I stand here on behalf of my friend, Sarah Daughter Fur. I believe in children. I believe they deserve to grow up. And I believe gun owners, gun sellers, and gun makers, we've got to hold them to a higher standard. They cannot do this to our community anymore. I think we're, if after nine, I think we're done. Okay. Uh, I think the, the sand is out of the hourglass. Uh, it's past nine o'clock. I just want to end by saying uh, two things. Number one, just how important these kinds of conversations are and for the citizens of this city that we all love to come out and have this conversation. The ultimate objective, I think, when you have an event like this, when you're depending on the public to share their information is that if you came into this session tonight with a rigidly fixed viewpoint regardless of what it was which side of the aisle it was if you leave tonight at least considering that you heard something that you may want to think about that doesn't jive with the fixed viewpoint you came in with so hopefully some of that cross-pollination occurred but the main thing again is thank you so much for for doing this and for um, using your democracy and most of all thank you so much to all the students we really appreciate it keep up the good work thank you all there's a middle schooler who's been waiting two hours to say thank you panel